All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Matt Pfeiffer. This is Conversations on Retail. We're so excited this morning to have Brand Elverston back, uh, continuing his series on a- asset protection and risk mitigation. And today, his guest is Dr. Adrian Beck, uh, Emeritus Professor from University of Leicester. Uh, just a couple of things before we, uh, as we get started, first want to recognize that uh, this group and series is being sponsored by our friends at Barcoding, at Rapitag, at Everseen, and at Action CS. And today's featured sponsor uh, is Rapitag. Founded in 2017, Rapitag developed the world's first patented anti theft IoT sensors for retail merchandise asset protection. With Rapitag's intelligent asset surveillance solutions, retailers can actively track and trace Rapitag IS tagged items for deeper product and customer behavior insights. So to start a conversation, contact Alex Schneider, the founder and CEO, or visit Rapitag. Dot com. Just a couple of ground rules before we kick things off. First of all, this is a conversation, and we would love for you to actively participate. So if you're joining us live, we hope that you will join in the conversation by asking questions and offering insights. To do that, simply click the Q&A button in Zoom and submit your questions and comments in writing. And then after the conversation ends, assuming we've got a few minutes left over, we will stop recording. And then anyone who wants to remain with us for a few minutes can unmute their microphone and participate in a short and open discussion. So to participate in the open discussion, you'll simply click raise hand and Brand will unmute your microphone and recognize you by name. So we're so glad you're here and let's get started. All right. Is uh, Matt said good afternoon or morning or night, wherever you are around the globe. Um, This is, I'm Brand Overston, your host for the series on asset protection. And this month, we are fortunate to be able to secure a time with Dr. Adrian Beck, Um, I'm not going to do his bio. I'll let him do that because I'll probably screw it up. But (laughs) before we, uh, as as context, I met Adrian. We were talking about it a little earlier. I think I met him in 05, 06, somewhere in that neighborhood at a conference in London, uh, a retail conference in London, and uh, grew pretty quickly to respect Adrian's objectivity, which is paramount in retail, as you know, Uh, You know, everybody that knows me knows I'm just going to say it. Not everybody in the business is that clean. Um, Adrian has done, Dr. Beck has done work with Walmart stores. He came over when I was still there. We spent, what, Adrian, a half a day or something quizzing a lot of people in operations all around what we're going to talk about today. Um, And, you know, the, the objectivity of the research is the result is what it is. It may not be favorable, it may not be what senior leadership is looking for, but it's factual and based on thorough objective analysis. So um, I'm tipping my hat to Dr. Beck because he's the standard bearer for that in our industry. He is used across the world by executives um, to help in the ROI analysis, to collect research, get his opinion, what works, what doesn't. Um, So Anyway, that's how I met him. So what is that? 20, 20 years anyway. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I probably had dark brown hair back then. Who knows? You might have had hair back then. I <laughs> had hair. Yeah, I probably <laughs> did, yes. Long gone. <laughs> so I'll let uh, Dr. Beck give his background and experience, and then we'll jump into the conversation. Yes, thanks, Brand. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, nice, nice to be part of this. Yeah, my name is Professor Adrian Beck. I'm I spent 30 years at the University of Leicester, uh, where I helped to um, establish the what is now the, the School of Criminology, but we set it up back in 1987-88. Um, and I've always had a, an abiding passion for doing research around the issue of loss and retail loss and loss prevention. And so I've spent many, many years doing a whole range of different projects, um, trying to help the industry understand it a little bit better, because it can be a bit of a dark art, can't it? You know, and there's lots of black holes in, in, in retail loss. And Perhaps more recently, over the last 20 odd years, I've been the academic advisor to the ECR Retail Loss Group, which is a a representative body of retailers and their suppliers. Initially started in Europe, but now it's much more global, which through their sponsors make research money available to carry out projects on burning issues for the industry. And that's where they will set me tasked to go out and try and understand and help and inform across a wide range of topics, you know, and I've, so I've spent a lot of time, we'll talk about today, Brand won't be around issues around self-checkout, and but I've done stuff on video, and I, I spent quite a lot of time developing the total retail loss concept to help 
help retailers understand that loss is a lot more than just a shrink number. So that's that's been a big piece for me quite over a number of years. Um, but also things like staff dishonesty and a whole range of different technologies. So I've been heavily involved in the industry for for very many years um, and continue to learn and hopefully can can hopefully hopefully continue to you know offer some value to the industry. Well, it certainly is, and we appreciate you giving us um, some time. Uh, so let's start off with kind of the evolution of uh, if we rewind back to self checkout and its debut. I know it has its roots in the what mid eighties, mid to late eighties. Mm. Uh, very slow adoption. I remember distinctly uh, when I was with Walmart going to the neighborhood market to look at this new thing called self checkout, and I believe that would have been the late nineties. Um, and we looked at it. Uh, Obviously, the emphasis was on the operational efficiency. What can we do with it? How do we, I mean, let's face it, automation, you know, helps trim the biggest line on the P&L, which is payroll. So how do we do this? And there was, um, I guess you call it emerging concern on, wait a minute, how do we monitor and make sure that uh, we have the same level or better of integrity in the checkout and tender process than we do on man lanes. And the technology never offered much in terms of mitigation. Uh, you remember the scales. That was our big aha. And that's what could be quickly implemented. So when the customers uh, scan something and they put it in the bag well, theoretically it would reconcile to the item file and say you're with within tolerance of whatever the weight is. And if you're not, it would do an alert. Uh, or it would say unrecognized item in Bagwell. Um, that was it until what I'll get to later in the conversation <clears throat> when we discovered Eversene. Um, but that was it until probably 20, I'm going to guess 14 ish, um, when we figured out that there's a better way to skin this cat because up until that point, it was nothing more than the scales. So, what is Kind of fill in the gaps there, uh, Adrian, um, on the evolution of self-checkout. And then, of course, we have a whole host of other tender options now. We have mobile, buy online, pick up in store. Mm -hmm. We have, a, a you know, proprietary device at the retailer. You know, Shopic is one. Pick it up, throw it on the cart, scan everything. Kind of take us on a historical journey, if you will, from where retail adopted in the 90s, I guess, on self-checkout and kind of where we are today. Yeah, you know, it, it, in, in many respects, it isn't new, as you said. I mean, there was systems around in the 80s and early 90s. But I think those who were using them, for the most part, it was very much a, a technology that was a little ahead of its time. It wasn't very reliable. Customers really didn't like it. They weren't ready for this concept. And so it sort of died off through the 90s a little bit. Um, and you didn't see very much of it. And then it, it began to come back again in the Really, you know, in sort of the mid 2000s, I, mean, I did my first study on SCO in 2011 um, when we were really just beginning to try and understand whether it would have an impact on loss or not. We really didn't know. Um, there are relatively few retailers using it. It was predominantly the what we call the fixed SCO technology, where a customer went to a machine and scanned their own items and then paid. Um, it was at that time, it was pretty glitchy stuff. Um, as you say, we got a lot of unexpected item in the bagging area message. It became almost a joke um, yeah. and, and a lot of hostility from customers. It was it was not a technology that was that was well liked by customers in the early days, certainly. But as you say, for, for retailers, there's a really powerful proposition around reducing costs around staffing. You know, and that is the key driver. We must never go away from the fact that the primary reason why retailers brought this in was because they could reduce you know, what is a considerable labor cost they have at checkout? And that was the main driver. So, you know, from sort of the, the mid 2000s onwards, we began to see this growth primarily in grocery. You know, that's the market that really dominates around self checkout because it makes a lot of sense because they employ so many people to check customers out. So it makes obvious sense that there's, there's savings to be made. And since then, I think we've seen uh, the range of variants grow. You know, we've gone from fixed SCO. We now have scan and go technology where, you know, the, the retailer provides the consumer with a scan device and they can walk around and scan their own items. You can now use your own mobile device, as you say. Um, we've got, you know, smart trolleys where you can wander around with a trolley that costs as much as a car. 
um, and trying, you know, put items in that will be scanned. Um, and, you know, you've now obviously got the autonomous stores as well. So the Amazon Go sort of concept where you literally scan yourself in and then you can pick items up and in theory leave. And so we've seen this, this growth in the complexity of what we mean by self-checkout technologies. Um, but I think what we're really seeing now, Brand, is that self-checkout is becoming the norm, certainly in grocery. It used to be the exception. It's now, I think, increasingly the norm. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to be seeing, I think, is that there's going to be, you know, one or two, what you call, you know, the traditional checkout, the staff checkout. They're going to become the exception, I'm afraid, for those who don't like it. And the norm is going to be a range of ways in which the consumer is expected to do their own checkout in, in, in retail, certainly in grocery, but now increasingly in other in other formats as well. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that. You know, the marketing play is always, and I have to chuckle sometimes when I see posts on LinkedIn, you know, the, these um, non-retail companies, I'll call it, will always say the customer demands or the customer <laughs> wants, you know, and I used to hear it in meetings, and, you know, our customers are telling us, and you know, internally, I'd say, all right, stop right there. What customers? Or did you pull that off a web scrape off Nielsen <laughs> survey? Uh, and it's done in major metro areas and affluent areas. That's not representative. It's specific to Walmart. The core customer is, and I live in a little small town uh, about 10 miles outside of Bentonville. I think the population, I'll guess, is six, 8,000 maybe. Doesn't even have a street light. And the stores, um, the store there started out man lane, as you say, with a handful of self-checkouts. And then somewhere along the journey, and this is within the last 10 years, somewhere along the journey overnight, you walk in the next day and boom, 100% self-checkout. And you got one or two other lanes. It's a rural community, farmers. Uh, yes, there are a lot of Walmart people that move out there. But um, so I have to chuckle when I hear that, you know, the customer demands all of this technology um, when in actuality you get in the stores. And that may be true in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where everybody's IQ is 900 or, um, you know, Pasadena, California at Caltech. But for the average Joe, um, I think it can be frustrating. And I think my suspicion is at some point when we depersonalize, we retail, depersonalize the retail experience and we continue on that uh, pass, um, it is going to be the competitive advantage to say, um, we actually have people in the store and on the sales floor. So how about that? You can actually go in as a shopper and say, hey, where are the tomatoes? Where do you, where do you put the dill pickles? Can I find an adapter for this computer? Yes, it's on aisle six. I'll take you to it. I think that'll be a competitive resurgence um, because you know there could be a case made that we're becoming over digitized in the retail environment and not striking that that balance. I think yeah, no, I think I think Brian, just to come back on that, I think I think you know I think what we're seeing is is there's there's a greater stratification of the way that retail is operating. You know, I, I can go into you know busy city centre stores at lunch times in particular. You know, and it would be hard to see how they would work now without self checkout. You know, they will have thirty machines all going full speed with customers checking out with three items over lunchtime. And you would not be able to do that with a staffed model in those types of retail stores. Yeah. So I think it's the sense of how you begin to get your balance of self-checkout to fit your demographic of particular stores. And I think to your point, there's a danger. You just end up with a uniform blanket approach. And actually what you need to do is have a much more nuanced approach to say, in this type of store, self-checkout is perfect. In this type of store, we may have a different requirement. And that is where I think the good retailers will succeed, is they'll understand their demographic and tailor their stores accordingly. Yeah, I was kind of kind of surprised at that because, you know, my experience, and it's no secret who I worked for, we're really good at knowing who our customer is. So in my mind, I, you know, that was really a surprise to most of us. Like, really? Um, P Ridge, yeah. Arkansas, you know, literally has no street light. It's a four-way stop sign. A lot of farms, and you know, you go stand in on uh, uh, the the line on a Saturday morning if you really want to know what a store looks like. And you hear a lot of, and we kind of chuckled um, 
about the language, but you'll hear, you know, I don't blank work for Walmart or they're frustrated because they're not technologists. It does take them time to find the barcode, figure out how to weigh the weighable produce. Um, so it can be be a bit aggravating. What you, you mentioned really self-checkout has its roots in grocery. Um, mm-hmm. Did you see an inflection point somewhere between those 90s, you you mentioned, I believe you said 2011. Is that really when it tipped, or? Well, that's that's really when I, you know, when when retailers first came to me to say we need to begin to understand this a little bit more. It's now becoming more common, and I did that study. I think back then with Tesco, and I think it was with Big Y in in the US who were interested. They were early advocates of this, trying this technology out, and I think it's from then onwards where we began to gradually see a larger proportion of transactions began to go through this and i think what retailers began to to realize is what how dramatic the labor saving could be yeah um and and what what was interesting about that for me was certainly in the early days the providers of this technology um were basically peddling the argument that it was zero cost in terms of shrinkage in fact they some were arguing and i remember interviewing one of them as part of my research where they said that losses would go down because customers would be more reliable than staff in terms of doing this. It was an extraordinary argument they were making. But they put forward this very persuasive business case to retail that you will save this ton of money through labor. And you did. But they were saying, oh, oh, and by the way, it won't cost you anything either in terms of increased losses. And so, you know, as a retailer, why wouldn't you want to do that? Okay, you've got to get over the hiccup of perhaps consumers not liking it, but that's, you know, getting the technology to work better. Yeah. Um, and I think it took a while, you know, so you had this huge sudden upswing where retailers were suddenly able to, you know, take off a lot of their costs dramatically in terms of labor. And it really wasn't until uh, I first remember in 2016, when I met the first retailer who began to, you know, sort of be concerned about the loss aspect. They began to see their numbers going up. They weren't quite sure why, but they know that they, they, it, they'd rolled out a lot of self-checkout. And yeah. suddenly their shrink numbers were going north. And that's when they first called me out and said, you know what, we need to understand this a bit more because perhaps it isn't, it, it isn't as rosy as, uh, as the people selling it might have told us. And, but by then, the trend was gone. You know, people, yeah. were, you know, the com- competition was saying, this is, this is what we have. And, and it's just really grown. I mean, I now talk to retailers in the UK where the expectation is that upwards of 85% of all their transactions will be through sell, some form of self-checkout in the next two years. It's that profound. Yeah, it, I'm trying not to laugh when when whoever was trying to sell that bill of goods, there's no risk to it. I mean, it, it, <laughs> clearly it wasn't a retailer that's been around for more than 20 minutes. Um, but, you know, we couldn't get, we retail could not get our arms around the loss or quantify. No. We, knew it, we knew it was happening. We would now and again stumble on uh, some clown coming in with, you know, a grocery cart full of Jack Daniels and he'd scan two. Pretty obvious stuff, low-hanging fruit we catch now and again, but we never were able to tip the cart with data internally to say, guys, we have a problem until I think uh, it was 2014-ish when I stumbled across Everseen's uh, website, uh, <clears throat> got uh, Mr. Chris Taylor on the phone, and um, long story short, uh, it took us a while, like it does in big bureaucracies, it took us a while to get it on board. But we ran it silent in a handful of stores. We actually pulled a team of people to sit there and look at the video because it was it, nothing was being reported at the store. This was blind to the store. And we were capturing the video and watching what items didn't get tendered. We could see the receipt coming down on the right-hand side. of Everything was showing, but we had to put dollars on it. So when we would see, the person would see a 12-pack of Pampers diapers for $39, they would key that in. They'd go to the item file, pull it up, get the retail. We did that for, I'm going to guess, a month, maybe six weeks. And the per store per day losses were staggering. That is what tipped when we were able to go to executive leadership and say, hey, here's what we're finding. And if you don't believe us, grab a cup of coffee. We'll put it on the big screen in whatever conference room you want and let's watch it. That's what. Uh, rang the bell, if you will, at the at the round table to say, okay, we have a problem. So Everseen uh, allowed, essentially allowed us to further penetrate self-checkout. 
because we now had an AI solution that could alert us real time and most of the big guys are fully aware of ever seen. That's what allowed us to continue to your point. Um, and we, we were accelerating heavily as were a lot of retailers and those that didn't that bumped into COVID really struggled because of the staffing shortages. So had that not occurred, um, I can't give you the dollar amounts, obviously, uh, but it was enough that when you do the math of, you know, per store times 365 times 4,000 stores, it's a really big number. It's bigger than a lot of companies' top lines. So we did that and it allowed us to, it, it, it did more than just quantify, Adrian. It allowed us to bring asset protection to the forefront with real data. Because as you said earlier in our conversation, shrink calculation and figuring out shrink is a bit of a soup sandwich. It's not as finite as how many tubes of toothpaste did you sell in the last 20 minutes? We can get that data. It's easy. We can't tell you how many Crest White Strips got stolen within a year. We think we know. We have approximations. Yes, we have inventory data, but we all know how accurate inventory is. So it's an educated guess at best. But ever seen really, uh, it was not an incremental change. It was seismic to say, here we are, guys. So we rolled, we rolled that out. So um, that helped us put dollars around those losses. Our, and I'll, I'm going to open, we're going to transition from fixed, as you say, the self-checkout terminal. So we have other channels. We have uh, companies, you know, that have the, the device, third-party device, a lot of grocery stores, you go in, pick it up, scan your license or something so it knows who you are. You scan all your own groceries, throw it in a cart, but you still have to go to a fixed station to tender. And presumably that gives the, the retailer at that point in time an opportunity to audit should they choose to do so. Um, and I'll leave that alone because that has a lot of privacy concerns and, and profiling, et cetera. But that's an opportunity. The one unanswered solution is, and we talked about Amazon Go earlier. There's a, other companies, iFi out in uh, Silicon Valley for cashierless stores. How do you mitigate risk on true mobile shopping where Adrian comes in with his smartphone, scans his own merchandise, throws it in a backpack? gets tender on that phone and walks out the door. How do you mitigate that? Yeah, it's yeah, it's one, it's one of the probably the the most scary versions I would say of self checkout. You know, uh, you know, you, you look at Scan and Go, and our data suggests that it's it's probably s generates seven times more loss than fixed Go in, in terms of the way. I'm that, glad you but, said that. I forgot to ask you that. What's the incremental? Yeah, in the yeah it, it, our data says it's about seven times more risky. Um, and we've really got that from, you know, as you say, the, the, the audit data is a moment in time when you actually get some data because you actually, as you say, the problem we have is, is the absence of data. If somebody steals something, you don't know for a year. And so therefore it just becomes unknown loss. But with an audit, you have a, you have a moment in time when you can check all the items and say, you didn't scan those three items. And that's an incredible insight into you know, not only the items that are not being stolen, but giving you a sense of the value of what isn't being stolen. And so certainly when you do, um, you know, the audit, it gives you data that we've never had before. The challenge, of course, is, you know, retailers typically rely on partial audits. So they'll say, well, we'll check six items in a basket of 50. Yeah. Um, and what our data showed was that if you do that, you catch around about 3% of people who haven't scanned an item. When you do a full audit, you catch 45% of people who haven't done something. So you miss a huge amount of people with partial audits. So it is, it's a flawed technology and approach that way, but it gives you data. And it is one of these four moments you have in a retail store with this sort of technology where you can try and impose some sort of control because you know risk management is about control. And so your first moment of truth is when the customer arrives at the store, do you identify them? So with my mobile phone, if I'm going to use your mobile app, you want to know I've arrived and you want to tell me that you know that I've arrived. Hello, Adrian. Nice to see you again. You're not anonymous. We know you've entered our store. That's a moment for me as a shopper and as a potential thief. I'm not anonymous anymore. 
The second moment of truth then is as you're walking around the store, how can you then impose control upon a person? Can you, can you try and make sure they're scanning all their items? Very, very difficult to do at the moment, unless you have an awful lot of cameras and a lot of smart technology that's very expensive. The third moment of truth is then the point of payment. Do you allow me to pay anywhere in the store on my mobile phone? Or do you say you must go to a fixed point and I want to have some sort of control over you doing it there and have the potential to do an audit there? And then the final moment of truth is when you leave the store. Do you give me free access to leave or not? Or is there some sort of control? And so that they're the four places when retailers can really have any influence over, over this. And with mobile, you potentially take one out, which is that, that payment point. If you allow me to pay anywhere in the store, how do you know I've paid? You know, it is the most important right. transaction element of retail. You've stocked yep. the shelves. You've allowed me access to the shelves. You would rather that I paid. It is really quite important part of the deal here, folks. So the payment moment is absolutely critical. And with mobile, do you want to let that be free reign? I can do it anywhere in the store as I'm walking out the store. The opportunity there for error and for people to take advantage is enormous. It really is. You know, the best will in the world, the most honest people in the world will be severely tempted if you begin to make it so extraordinarily easy to pay or not pay. And that's what we've seen with this technology is that people make mistakes with it, but also you raise the opportunities that they some people will take advantage of. Sure. And, you know, it. so when we move from, and it really became a rub on self-checkout. So pre-COVID, <clears throat> let's forget COVID for a minute. Um, the interaction when customers would pick up secured merchandise that had a liquor lock on it or spider wrap or an acrylic case or something. It even added more friction to what was supposed to be frictionless at self-checkout. Um, the operators, rightfully so, are obsessed with frictionless checkout. They, you know, you got to remove all that clunky 1970s technology. Um, <clears throat> there are companies, one of our sponsors, Rapid Tag, I saw them at Euroshop, I guess it was 20. 19 maybe, um, that in the scenario of true mobile shopping, so we saw in the news, what was that, four or five months ago, <clears throat> excuse me, there was a retailer that abandoned mobile checkout because of the losses. It was in public knowledge. Um, Walmart also, we had three or four runs at mobile and it was, we couldn't get our arms around that component of it and adoption and some other complexities. But there was no answer for, okay, go shop the store. And then how do you take all these gadgets off if you're not going to self-checkout? So now I've got to go to the pay station if I do go to a pay station and I've got to rehandle all the merchandise. I got to have all the keys to take that stuff off. So the rapid tag solution is exactly what is needed because it removes that friction. I can take it off myself with my phone. So I would go into target.com sign on. It knows to your points. It knows me. The anonymity is gone. They know what I'm doing. I would be able to remove those devices um, anywhere in the store if I chose to be able to, to tender before walking out. Um, the visual component is the most concerning. We have no visual. We retail have no visual observation on a true mobile checkout transaction. To your point, we hope like hell you paid for it, but we really don't know. We're looking at data. Sure, we can see the transaction, presumably real time or near real time, but we have no visual. And without that, we really don't know. We don't know that Adrian picked up two bottles of Jack Daniels and both went in the backpack and he only scanned one. Only the camera is going to tell me that at this point. Yeah, so I think, I think the, the issue that we're, we're tagging, I think, and and. It, it is where old old meets new tagging. You know, we've had tagging since the 1970s, as you know. And, you know, it's got a checkered history. Yeah. Um, the, the, the challenge with tagging is, yes, you can tag some items, but but what we see with when we analyse scan and go data on what is what is not being scanned yeah. is it's just not the traditional hot items. It's everything isn't getting scanned. It's from it's from tins of beans to, to milk. You know, it's the, it's the box standard shopping basket where people are yeah. making errors and not scanning items. And so, you know, the challenge is you can't tag everything. 
and, and so you can certainly tag your, you know, super high vulnerable items that we've always done, which is bottles of alcohol, you know, razor blades and all the usual suspects. Yeah. But the challenge with self-checkout is just the breadth of product that customers are not very good at scanning or deliberately not scanning. And that's where I talk about the death by a thousand cuts with self-checkout, which is you can have an organized retail criminal go into a store and they could steal $5,000 in one go. You know, they could sweep your shelf, take all your razor blades in one go, 5,000 gone. The very same day, you could have 2,500 customers taking $2 each through self-checkout. It's the same amount of loss, but it's just done in a very different way. And that's the way that SCO has increased the volume of potential risk uh, takers mm-hmm. and loss manufacturers, loss producers. The, 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 the population has grown phenomenally in terms of the people who can now generate loss in your stores. Whereas in the old days, you know, you may have a you know 10 or 15 you know, known thieves who will steal a lot. Now you've potentially got everybody who's entering the store. That's the challenge, I think, for retail, is how do you actually manage that loss when it could be potentially every product and everybody doing it. That's, that's a really, big challenge, I think. That's a really good point, Adrian. And I'm, uh, you know, ORC has always been a thing, but it's in the press, everything you look at, even LinkedIn today, the smash and grabs and all that. And sure, it's a big deal, huge mm-hmm. money. Uh, Absolutely. And, you know, and I know uh, ASDA, when they were part of Walmart, they were always better at total loss versus traditional loss in the US, the shrink. Uh, you know, of which there's some schools of thought that say the vast majority of shrink is theft. I never subscribed to that only because I had a deep appreciation for the entire operational sequence from purchase order creation to the desk. Uh, And obviously certain stores have disproportionate penetration of various components of loss. But for the retailer to adequately be able to get their head around um, the loss is that bookend to bookend understanding, and it always used to be spirited conversations with us is, you know, okay, so if you think in all your stores that the vast majority, so if you look at the NRSS study, I think it's still pegging it somewhere around 70% is malicious intent. I don't subscribe to that in aggregate. Um, If it's really all theft, then one of two things is true. Either that isn't true, or you do a really bad job at detecting and mitigating theft. It's one of the two, because you still have a high shrink store. So um, the solutions that we put in place, so to your earlier point, you go into stores today, we've seen it online, everything's locked up. Ice cream, you've seen the logging chains going through the cooler door handles, everything is locked up. I was in, where was I last week? Charlotte, no, Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina various stores all doing the same thing. Just about everything was either locked up or out of stock. You'd walk to the razor blades, you'd see one or two and a bunch of empty peg hooks. So, you know, I think there's still a school of need, if you will, on understanding, as I referenced earlier, ASDA, they did a better job in total loss. They understood all the moving parts better than I think a lot of uh, retailers in the U.S. do instead of gravitating immediately towards what's most sexy, what gets the headlines, what gets your adrenaline pumping is running down the shoplifter, catching all those guys. Um, Because we found ourselves in this, this, well, you could almost make the case, impetuous pursuit of technology for retail. We're not going to stop that train. We didn't stop self-checkout 25 years ago, and we're not going to stop true mobile shopping. But when you look at the risk associated with it, it's those companies like Everseen or Rapid Tag that, that have the intelligence that would be able to say, you're making a good decision or you're going down a rabbit hole. That isn't your problem. And I'm, yeah, I'm really glad uh, you mentioned the mix of product on self checkout. That's interesting. Yeah, I think, you know, I think, you know, I think what we need to recognize, and, and this is where studies like the, you know, the, the NRF you know, annual survey that's been going on forever, yeah. uh, it, it sometimes is not helpful is right. that they just throw all the retailers together into one pot. Yep. So we end up with this national number. Uh, and then we get them to play the guessing game as to what proportion of their loss they think is due to unknown loss. You know, It, yep. it tells you more about how they feel than what is the reality of loss in retail stores. Um, 
but but what it does is it just mashes together the risk profiles of very different retailing. You know, the, in a in a grocery store, the profile of risk is fundamentally different than an apparel store, which is fundamentally different to a DIY store, which is fundamentally different to an apparel store. And therefore, we mustn't say, you know, that that you know, you know, because in an apparel store, you won't get wasted, you won't get damage on the level you will in a grocery store. So that total retail loss picture will be very different in a grocery store than it will in others. So I think we need to be much more nuanced in how we reflect upon the risk and, th- and therefore what might be an appropriate intervention in any in any particular place. You know that you know tags work well. We know in apparel, you know, hard tags, when we've seen people yet again trying to take them off and replace them with RFID tags and, and hoping it will deliver their loss prevention solution, and it isn't doing it. Yeah. Because we know that's you know the idea of this visual deterrence is terribly important, and people are used to seeing it in that, in that environment. In, in grocery, hard tags are really hard to manage because it's often yeah. fast-moving, low-value product. You haven't got the labour to put the tags on and off these things, and it simply isn't worth exactly. it. So you need a different strategy, which may you know, require you know, thinking about the problem in a different way. So I think we need, you know, we need to move away from having this blanket approach to understanding risk and say, yes, for some companies, theft is the biggest problem they've got. You know, an ORC targets that. For others, you know, it may be a very different issue. It might be about just getting customers to scan accurately and you therefore you use technologies that are going to facilitate them. You know, one of the things that Everseen are really interesting about Everseen is their their idea around trying to push the concept of nudge. Can you nudge somebody back to doing the right thing? Um, and we know that when you introduce lots of shoppers to opportunity, for the vast majority, you can push them back to honesty really easily. They didn't set out to steal stuff. They're just taking yeah. opportunities, a bit like speeding. You know, you take it if you can, but if you stop, then you don't do it. Um, and it's a little bit like that around self scans. And, and so what Everseen are doing is saying, hey, look, you didn't scan that last item. Why don't you have another go? And that's communication with the shopper. And the shopper goes, Oh yeah, I didn't. Okay, fine. Rescan speeds up the transaction. Doesn't involve a member of staff. Everybody's happy, and so I think it's that sort of technology where you can really begin to, you know, make that technology work more effectively and be a lot smarter, uh, which I think is really interesting in this world. You know, I agree with you. You know, at the end of the day, we're never, as we always used to say, we're never going to arrest our way to low shrink, um, and. You bring up an interesting point because I did that survey for Walmart from 1996 until probably 2015, the NRS study, or and it is subjective. And uh, <clears throat> you know, we we pull some of the data, but at the end of the day, when you do the pie chart they used to have that said how much is theft, how much is external, internal, admin, blah blah. Yeah, it was you know an exercise of you know have a beer and pick a number. <laughs> and, you know, in the later days, I tried to sit down with all the senior leadership and say, look, guys, I know this is a, you know, we got to pick a number. But, you know, and it was interesting. So when J.P. Suarez, our VP back in 05, he was yeah. a legal counsel. He was not a born and bred AP guy. So he didn't know squat. Uh, but what he did know was the objective, objectivity of data and reality of what's happening and he was really one of the first to come along the lines that, um, you know, theft is a problem, but it isn't the problem. Don't come in here and tell me 70% of that massive number is theft. Because if it is, you ain't doing something right. Really, You're really screwing something up. So there's got to be other contributors. And those that fully understand the rest of the box, the price change errors, administrative claims, throwaways, you mentioned all of that stuff goes in that bucket. Um you begin to be more effective about mitigating shrink and what you do to be able to remove that friction from the customer. I don't need to put spider wrap on every one of the TVs I sell. My problem is the 65 inches and bigger, or I don't need to put liquor locks on 7,000 bottles of liquor when it's probably 10 or 15 bottles, the good stuff that goes out the door. We, we don't have the data to be able to back into that. So you're right, it's an emotional, it's all theft um, component and you know, salt in the wound is all the mobile stuff being introduced is driving people crazy. It's like, my God, <clears throat> you know, how do I know an order filler? Buy online, pick up in store. Adrian's the personal shopper in the store. Brand Overston goes online, keys in all my stuff. You get the order on your handheld, you go fill it, but we're buddies. 
what stops you from putting uh, a couple extra boxes of Crest White Strips or the newest video game in the box and out the door? Nothing is the answer to that because it goes out of a typically unprotected door out the side of the building. And, you know, if it's protected, it's got a camera that probably nobody's watching. Maybe an EAS tower, which, as you stated earlier, is really, you know, <laughs> inconsequential. Um, so the stress with the reduced staffing coming out of COVID, the push to <clears throat> technology and over-reliance sometimes is really what's driving the, in my experience, Adrian, almost 30 years now, never seen shrink numbers like we see today. So it was a perfect storm and it's only going to be exasperated. So companies that come in and do innovative things and they can mitigate, this is their day in my mind. Yeah, I think, yeah, you know, I think I'm just at the moment working on um, on a typology for e-commerce losses because this is a new area that a lot of loss prevention people are now having to move in because, you know, the business is now maybe 20% of their transaction value is going through omnichannel or online. It's an area of new risk and, and, and loss and so on. So I'm trying to put together what does that loss look like, you know, and um, how do you begin to put a value on that and understand it? And so, you know, retail has become much, much more complicated than it ever was. You know, we now have, you know, the whole world of omnichannel is extraordinary in terms of what, yeah. what choice you're now giving the consumer. Um, and the different ways in which they can shop, the way, different ways in which they can check out. We've created an extraordinarily amount of complexity into retail. And you know, through all your experience, the more complexity you have, the more likelihood you have for things to go wrong and sure. the more opportunity generated for people. And so it doesn't surprise me in some respects that losses are going up because we're making retail so much more complicated and there's more opportunity there. Um what I do, what I think is important to understand, though, particularly around SCO, is and, and companies are not obviously sharing this very much, is we need to think about the return on investment in the round. In that, you know, if you were to factor in the labor saving that has gone on around that, you know, and I've seen some of the numbers, and the numbers are extraordinary in what, what the companies have saved through labor, is it may be that we have to rethink what we mean as an acceptable level of loss within retailing. It could be, you know, we used to, you know, we've seen that with the, you know, the NRSS numbers gone down. It went down for 20 years in a row, basically. I mean, it went down from the high 1.8 down to a low of about 1.4, something like that. And it's dipped back up to 1.6 and then down again. It may be that the new reality is 1.7. That's the, that's the fact of life, given the way that you want to, you know, the, the type of choices you've made as a retailer, the labor model that you've adopted. That is the new reality of loss. And you need to factor that into your return on investment model as a business. Um, because, you know, I, I, you know, I've seen this in SCO where they, you know, they went for the minimal labor model with SCO because that was the deal. You know, folks, you can save yourself so much labor. Minimize labor. Go down to one person looking after 20 machines. Fabulous. Look at all the savings we've made. And guess what? They can't do it and losses yeah. go up. And so I think what, what, what we're now seeing is a, is a realization within retail that you need what I'm calling an optimum control labor model, which is how many people do you need to make sure that the losses are manageable in this space? And let's be realistic, folks. You know, if you want zero losses, forget it. Yeah. But what, what are acceptable losses for you as a business, given the savings you've made through this introduction of this technology? And that's where I think retailers are now having to readjust it's difficult in this labor market because the problems of getting labor and keeping labor is tough but i think there's this sense of realization that actually losses aren't always going to be going down you need to think about it in the broader picture of, of the nature of retail and the profits that you can make across your entire organization who do you, who do you think as a retailer is doing self-checkout right yeah, it's a, it's a very, very good question. And, and I see, you know, best practice in lots of different areas. And, 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 and I think, you know, the ones where I see that are doing it well um, are, are really planning for the future with this, which is that they recognize that you need to get certain things in place to make it work well. You need to have proper levels of guardianship. So people that are well-trained, well-motivated, you know, an acceptable ratio of labor that they've designed their stores with SCO in mind. You know, you remember when it first came in, you just put it in the available space, which was usually <laughs> by the exit, wasn't it? Exactly. There's some space there, wasn't it? 
Yeah. And so, you, you know, you, you redesign your front end to understand the risk associated with it and you create zones of control because we know the risks that are now associated. So you have this sense of design and then you have this suite of wonderful technologies that are coming in now. We, we really are blessed now that video technologies in particular and video analytics are really beginning to mature, I think. It's taken a while now because, you know, what, what Everseen were trying to do in the mid-2000s and Stoplift and other people like that was really hard. You know, you were trying to identify objects and you had to decide, was it, was it, a, you know, a, was it a, a tin of beans or was it my hand? Was it my hand basket? You know, was it, was mm-hmm. it my child? You know, th- this is complicated work for video to do. And I think it's taken time for that technology to mature to the point where it's sufficiently reliable not to irritate the customer and cause too many false positives, which is, which irritates the staff. Yeah, so we, I think we, you get that technology mix right. You know, I think there's a lot of opportunity to create this this risk amplification zones of control to make them effective. Yeah, I you know <clears throat> specific to Everseen, we put them through the ringer. You know, because there were people that were part of that uh, review team that their purpose was to find fault and dismiss. Um, you know, th- th- that's that's a pretty uh, standard. Um, environment in retail when the asset protection guys are trying to get something done there's always going to be some technology guy or somebody at the table that's looking for a reason to say no and they passed with flying colors obviously and they got into a bunch of stores at walmart um one thing i'll say and then i got another question on the screen um is the better the technology gets around inventory management so let's step out of the <clears throat> malicious intent silo for a second. Look at total, you know, receivings and purchase orders and all that stuff. The total sh- total loss perspective. Yeah. The better retailers get with technology, whether it's artificial intelligence, machine learning, whatever. Um, some of the understated losses that have been understated for years will now become accurate. So there is a component of this shocking increase and in shrink that we're seeing as a result of better technology, better accounting, better check-in processes, better um, warehouse operations, better uh, reconciliation of purchase orders. That's going to put a light on the true shrink. And I can't go into detail, but I have experience with that in my past. We're like, hang on a minute. If you really want to fix inventory and apparel, do you really want to know that you your system is really overstating your ownership or understating your ownership? Because if you correct it, you have RFID and now it's whistle clean or it's way more accurate than you know Bubba coming in with a crayon and a, and a legal pad counting. Holy crap, that just took my shrink number from 1.5 to 1.8. So there is a component of that. I'm not saying that's a major contributor to the massive increases we've seen in the last three years. But it's something a true operator has always got to be cognizant of. If we get better at what we do, we're going to find out things we didn't know, and it may not be good news. So we yeah. got to prepare for that. We no, I think you're right. Readers, or we put in self-checkout. We gotta, there's got to be some level of second-order thinking to think, okay, it's awesome, but we got to talk about the risk. And don't tell me that the labor savings will balance <laughs> the risk out. So, yeah, risk will go up a little bit on self-checkout. But, hey, we saved $700 trillion on payroll. But I guarantee you when the shrink numbers come in, that conversation is going to have been forgotten. <laughs> and, yeah, you're laughing. You know the script. Yes. So, <laughs> let me ask this other question here. It says, uh, what's on the horizons in terms of technology, predictive analytics, that's going to really – move the needle. We already talked about ever seen that was huge in my personal experience in the past, allowing us to further penetrate with reducing risk. Are there any players out there that, for example, Euroshop, that don't quite have their legs yet, but holy crap, when they do, it's going to change. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, when you when you think about it's, it's easy to forget how profound the Amazon Go experience was when it first that video first came out seven years ago now. Yeah. Uh, and the idea that, you you know, it, it, it was like science fiction, wasn't it? That you could actually walk into a store, pick items up and leave and never go to a checkout. It was it was profound in, its, in, it, in how dramatic it was. Yeah. And I think what we've now seen is that that sort of technology is taking a lot of time. It's not cheap. 
Um, yeah. It's difficult to scale it. You know, you look at all the stores it's used in around the world. We've seen lots of people, you know, there's a big Polish company using it, some in Scandinavia. Others are trying it. But the stores are small. The yeah. SKU range is small. The number of customers is very small usually. And so, you know, I think that's where we'll be maybe 15, 15 years down the line is we could see a lot more autonomous stores coming in around that. But I think in the, in the, in the short to medium term, I think, I think we're going to see a lot more use of video analytics and, and product identification and product recognition that will help um, help staff be more effective. You know, one of the things I've, I've, I've always been interested in is, you know, that you end up with, with, with SCO guardians are very reactive people. They wait for the lights. And they run around like headless chickens, just just turning off lights all the time. They're or not you're very, updating Facebook in the case. Yeah, you know, it, it, <laughs> but it can be. You know, my research showed it's it's a it's a pretty difficult task because that you know they can't. That you know the data shows that um, the majority say they can't cope with the amount of machines that they're allocated, yeah. and it's you know it's a fact of life. It's a tough job, but I think we can begin to give them access to technologies that can make their job easier. So it can be, for instance. You know, I enter the SCO area with my my basket or my trolley, and my trolley or basket is scanned for risky products or products that may cause frustration. Mm-hmm. And a member of staff is alerted to say the customer going to machine number four has got wine involved, so you're going to have to do an age check, or it's got a tag on it, so why didn't you go over there now and deactivate it? Or they've got a known non-scannable item, why don't you go and give them some customer love and make sure they scan that item? And so the technology needs to, I think, engage with staff in an interactive way to, to turn them to be much more proactive than reactive at the moment. So I think there's a lot of work that can be done around video and video analytics, I think, that is because it's become so much cheaper, hasn't it, Brad? You know, you remember the first early days of, of the technology. It's expensive, it, you know, and it was hard to maintain. It was hard to get networks to, to work well. We're living in a very different, more connected world where technology is a lot cheaper and and the capacity of this technology now is moving really quite quick. And so I think that's the exciting area around how we can use that, but not forgetting it's got to work with people. You know, yeah. retailing is fundamentally a people job. You know, it's, it's got even, customers. Even though we got fewer people. Yeah, yeah fewer, fewer, but they've got, they, they got to do things. They've got to do more things, you know. So I think technology can help them. Yeah, the, the two things that I've learned in the – well, it became apparent probably about 2010-ish – uh, and then long about the time Mike Lamb became our vice president, and as everybody on the phone or on the call knows, Mike's now at Kroger. But there were two things that, that really rang my bell back in the mid-2000s was if I come to the table with a solution that does nothing but address theft, my likelihood of success in securing capital for that is far less than if I come in and say, we can help with inventory management, or we can help with purchase order accuracy, or we can help with throwaways. And oh, by the way, it'll stop Billy Bob from running out the front door with, you know, five, six packs. So it's got to solve for more than the malicious intent. The second thing is that in the day and age we're living in, and you and I both know, as does everybody on the phone, that if a retailer survived COVID with the big reduced reduction in staffing, they might they might tick up a little bit, but all of the accountants and the people that look at payroll are like, wait a minute, we survived COVID, one of the worst times in modern history in retail with fewer staff. We don't need to go back to pre-COVID staffing levels. What happened in, in my mind is the solutions we had available in today's environment all required human intervention at some point. EAS goes ding at the door. It isn't worth a damn if somebody doesn't say, hey, wait a minute and do something with it, which, you know, EAS has been around 50 years. So um, uh, lock and show cases, reduce staffing. That is a, it is, was a friction point before. Now it's even more so because there's nobody there to unlock the case. So in the solution environment, my counsel, it always is, is look, you got to solve for more than loss. Because if it's any amount of money, you know, you go to a financer and be like, well, you know, it's expensive. Well, so is, you know, umpty ump zillions of dollars we lose every day. And then also taking into account the inherent lack of execution in store employee required interactions. We, as we always say in retail, we suck at execution. We got human beings in the store. I don't do everything I'm supposed to do every day. Nobody does. 
So those gaps in execution have to be accounted for with the technologies you're talking about. But the solution industry has got to start migrating to we don't need a human in the chain. We can do report and alert on opportunities independent of human intervention. So let me... Uh, let's just, just, on that, just on that, though, Brian, I think where, where I give from you on that is, is I never talk about solutions. And I think this is where the industry has gone wrong a bit, is I talk about interventions. We don't yeah. know this stuff works. We, you know, they, people, yeah. people say, I've got a solution for you. And I say, well, you've only got a solution once we've tested and it works in my environment. And I understand how it works in my environment. Until then, you've simply made an intervention. Uh, and, and so I think we need to, you know, need to educate the industry to say, your solution, if you want to call it that, is actually really an intervention. It, it, it's got a potential to deliver a return on investment for me. If we do this, we do this, and we do this, and this works. Yeah. And then it becomes a solution. But up until that point, for me, they're always interventions because people can promise you the world, as you know, but yeah. two years later, they go, oh, I'm terribly sorry, your losses haven't gone down. Well, that was, that was <laughs> the challenge we had with EAS. You know, I'm like, all right, when do we ever get past ding at the door? That <laughs> You were doing that in 1970. W what am I supposed to do with that? I'm not going to have people at the doors, every door, in every store, in 5,000 stores. So what is next gen? How do you solve that for me, independent of having to have somebody at the door? Um, I've got another uh, question here. We have about four minutes. Uh, ticket switching. At self checkout, we know that's a big deal. Always has been, even on front man lanes. You know, I remember you know putting the Wrigley's gum over the barcode of a of a you know a Wii, and it would ring up Wrigley's. Everything visually looked like they rang it up, but they didn't. Uh, but that's now a thing, obviously, at self checkout. And ever seen addresses that very well. Um, I'm not sure what the question is here. That looks more of a statement. Uh, Jiffy Mix corn scans at 73 cents in exchange for a hundred dollar brisket. True, hundred percent true. Um, but I think you know the technologies can be smarter than that. So it would know visually potentially if once we get to item recognition, is to say, wait a minute, that was not a seventy three cent Jiffy corn mix. That was entirely different dimensionally, visually. However, we do that, um, and be able to implement that. And I think we could, we could have a staged approach to this, which is you don't have to, you know, this idea that you need product recognition. So you need to identify every single product in a store. You know, and that's a hard, right. that's a long run because it's, oh, you could wow. have 60, 70,000 items in a store. That's well, actually what, what you can have is a much more limited list, which is these 15 items are the ones that people typically claim to non, you know, to miss scan. So in Tesco's, people are always claiming something is a brown onion. So you'll see loads of brown onions going through as strawberries and avocado. So all the system needs to do is say, I, can, I just need to recognize a brown onion. So when you put, put, put the strawberries on the scale and press brown onions, the system will go, they're not brown onions. I don't know what they are, but they're not brown onions. <laughs> and so you end up with a much limited recognition system, which is more manageable, and you're doing it by exception. I definitely know it isn't that thing because I, I can see that. And so you end up with a sort of a dynamic action list of known known items that, that thieves try and get away with. And you identify those. And so you end up with an incremental approach to product recognition, which is less daunting and less demanding, I think, of the system providers than saying, I need a database containing 60,000 images of all my products. Actually, you might just need 20. You might need 25 or next, next year you might need 30. But you yeah. can deliver the benefit that way. Um. We, uh, let's see, I'm, I'm looking at the screen here. Um, let me ask you this question, Adrian. Are, are you seeing as a result of COVID or the increases in shrink, the complexities, everything we've talked about, are you seeing a slowing of adoption of non-traditional uh, technologies or have you seen the opposite or is it pretty much a straight trend line? It's speeding up, I think. Okay. I, mean, I think... You know, I think we can, you know, I think we can, we've gone past COVID and, and what we've seen now is actually the levels of e-commerce have gone back to the growth rates that we saw before COVID. Yep. So it's growing around about 5% before COVID. It, it exploded through COVID. It's now dropped back to a growth rate of about where it was before. The consumer has gone back to shopping in shops. Sure. Yep. You know, there's this idea that this would be the end of, you know, as we always have, the end of the, the high street or the mall. 
Um, but what we are seeing, I think, certainly I'm seeing, in, you know, and it's different country by country, of course, you know, that there are some countries who are marching forward with SCAR far more than others. Uh, but in the UK, the, the trend is for more and more and more. You know, I think that that's why that's why I started out saying, you know, what, what we're seeing is self-checkout is now the norm. Yeah. And I think that it, what, but what I am seeing more of, I think, is and where I think the business case is much, much more challenging is I'm seeing people going into apparel now where they're saying, let's put self-checkout into apparel. And some have been doing it for ages, you know, Zara in, the U, in, in Europe and using it to a degree. Not many customers used it. But the, the labor model is very different there, isn't there? You know, in a typical apparel model in a store, you can't strip out 70 percent of the labor. There'd be virtually nobody there. That's and right. so the idea you can, you know, you can you can get the labor saving and manage that risk in that environment, I think is really quite challenging. And therefore, I think those who are leaping into that area need to think carefully about what the return on investment and risk profile might look like when you know when you get out of grocery and into other sort of markets for this sort of stuff. I agree. Um, Matt, we are at the top of the hour. Do we have more time for Q&A or? I, I've got all the time in the world. It just depends okay. on on you and your gracious guest. Well, I I have uh, time up until I think 1130 my time. So another half hour. Um, as long as the questions come in and there's value, let's uh, I've got a couple more questions and we'll see what comes across uh, what comes across the screen. Um, so Adrian, if if uh, you've been around, you said since the late eighties, um, trying to get my head around nuances that you've observed in that span of time. Mine is more immersed at Walmart, um, and albeit incremental trend lines, you know, you, you kind of get in the forest and you can't see the trees sometimes, but you've had that objective global view, which is what I respect most about you, not only your objectivity, but you do a global view. You don't sit in London and interview people from London and call that data. You're all over the globe. Um, are there are there regions of the or regions of the world that are doing things differently? They're still in the 50s. They're do you see things that if somebody on the on the line has a global retail presence like Walmart or other retailers, where would they go to see something different? Is it EMEA? Is it Europe, US, Asia? What's your thought on that? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, I think there's, you know, since since I've been researching this, you know, there, there are three main trends we've seen in 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 loss prevention and retailing that are combined. One, one is, you know, we've seen a dramatic change in the in the in the risk landscape. You know, as you know, it's it's far broader span of issues that that loss prevention people have to deal with now than ever before. They have to spin a lot more plates, I think, than they've ever had to do. Secondly, um, I think we've seen you know a dramatic change in the quality of the data that is available to all, and it is profound. I remember back in 1988 when one of the first shrink surveys that were done in the UK. And they needed a, a range of, of one billion pounds to cover the, where the data might be. So they said that the losses could be between one and two billion. <laughs> it's a huge change. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and so it just showed how, how you know, I, I talk about retailers living in a data desert back then. You know, it, it was it was not there. Whereas now, you know, we, we now see that they are living in a data lake. It's not a lack of data, it's almost too much data. You know, you have this huge quantity of data that can inform you about what you're doing now. Um, so I think that is a really profound change in, in terms of, of what we're now seeing. I think where retailers are getting good, the good ones are using that data. You know, they've got the data analysts. They're beginning to be much more nuanced in the way that they're developing their risk profiles to understand what's happening in their stores, how they manage their online presence, using, using technologies in a far smarter way. Um, and that that that's where I see the big the big wins for the retailers who understand the importance of that data and the degree to which they're able to think about data beyond the traditional sources. You know, so we used to think, you know, back in the old days of CCTV, when it was all analog, it was video tapes. Yep. Now, yeah, now video is just another stream of data. 
Yeah. It's just another digital stream of data that you can do things with. You can you can do all sorts of extraordinary things. And so, people, you know, what I'm seeing is this sense of it, those who are doing it well are integrating these data sources together, networking that data across their organizations. And then to a point you made earlier is recognizing that good interventions, good approaches are cross-organizational in terms of fixing things. And we see this particularly with video. I keep coming back to this, but video just used to be a, a comfort blanket for retailers. When things go wrong, go and look at the video. <gasps> look what happened. Now, you, now we're seeing, you know, that people in marketing are using it. People are using it for on-shelf availability. People are using it to try and ident- to deter burglars at the back of the store. You know, the, the, the range of use cases is now profoundly different. And it's across the, across the board. So I think what I'm seeing, the good ones, are understanding how they can leverage that technology across the business because it makes the business case so much more persuasive. And actually, the loss prevention teams are, are really these agents of change, these agents of oh, influence yeah. across the business. Um, and so that was a long-winded way, I think, of, of you know, the, the good ones I'm seeing are doing that. And that isn't geographic. I think it's about the, the, the culture of the business and the culture of the leaders of loss prevention in understanding their role and what they can do within their own organizations. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, kind of <clears throat> in my simple mind, you know, if we had leveraged technology as an industry, as a risk mitigation industry, if we had uh, paced at the evolution of retail operations, we wouldn't see the pictures we see today with the logging chains and, you know, a, a piece of paper on the shelf saying, if you want one, go see, you know, Tammy Sue in the back. You wouldn't see all these things that we were doing back in the last century. So while it may be out there, um, and it is, I agree with you. I'm, I'm going to Euro Shop a week from tomorrow. I love it over there. You always see innovative things. And I agree, there are a lot of, they're beyond interesting. They almost look like this is a no-brainer solution. We just got to figure out how to get these at scale to be able to mitigate the loss so we don't have to do what uh, you see in the stores because they're not parallel uh, universes. In my 25 years experience, the evolution of solutions and asset protection loss prevention was nowhere near that of operations. If it was, we wouldn't have been caught with our pants down when self-checkouts came out in the 90s. We had Mm -hmm. enough solution for that. Uh, And we're still playing catch up. It's kind of like trying to catch Hussein Bolt on the track. Good luck with that. but we're getting much better and I'm encouraged. And to your point, yes, the industry has changed. If I had to put my finger on a calendar, I would say it probably started tipping around 05, 07-ish maybe um, for various reasons, uh, leadership differences, um, people that had come from other disciplines, um, JP Suarez being a great example from Walmart. He was uh, general counsel for Sam's Clubs. He didn't know that. I'll I'll say it because I know him. He didn't know diddly squat about the industry, but he was smart enough to know what he didn't know. And he relied heavily on those that did know. And uh, so we have made we have made some uh, interesting. Yeah, it it has. You know, we've seen different people coming in uh, and I think they're building different types of teams. You know, it used to be. You know, this is no criticism of them, but it used to be very police heavy, wasn't it? You know, it used to be if you you hadn't had a career in the police or the military, you didn't get the job. Right. Um, because that was the nature of the beast. And I think now that those people still have a role within the team. But but we've also seen people come in who understand the business, you know. So we see very successful heads of loss prevention, as to your point, you know, have never been near, you know, the sort of law enforcement role. But they understand some of the challenges and they can le- leverage people within their team to deliver this sort of thing. You know, I'm just I'm just starting a project at the moment around, you know, how do how does the loss prevention function team up with the buyers? You know, because the, the idea, you know, you said it earlier there, which is it's traditionally very reactive. Yep. Something blows up in our faces, LP to the rescue, you know, come riding in on the white charger, fix the problem yet again. Yep. What I'm looking at is how do those progressive retailers start down the supply chain, talking to the buyers, saying what's coming next? What product is coming? What changes are we doing to our retail? How do we then decide which stores to put them in to protect them in different types of stores because they've got different risk profiles? And so really thinking in a more proactive way about how we manage what are hot products and hot, and, and hot stores and tailoring the, 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 the business approach. Because 
ultimately, you know, the business doesn't want to put a load of stock into a store where A, it's not going to sell and B, it's just going to get stolen. There's no point in putting it there. Put it in the stores where it's going to sell and put it into stores with the right protection to enable you to sell it in, in other sorts of stores. And that requires a much more stratified, you know, and it requires a lot more data and a lot more knowledge and understanding of the business. But you can be much more proactive then. And instead of going, oh, goodness me, Fusion Fire has just arrived from P&G and everybody's stealing them, you know, off the shelves and we don't know what to do. Let's go and put some tags on them again. Yeah. You know, so I think that's an interesting, you know, thinking to be much more proactive, I think, is how, how I see the future as well. Yeah, I agree. And you can imagine in 1995, when I went to Walmart, I was fresh off active duty. Um, only I didn't know the difference between cost and retail. I had just finished <laughs> my MBA program. And you can imagine I wasn't, you know, when I went to the interview and there were probably 50 people in this mass interview. And I walked in the door and I thought, holy crap. I don't have a chance at this. These are all career LP guys. You're right. They had been catching shoplifters and that's what they were doing and they were ready for the next step. And uh, it was a different leader that gave me the opportunity and pulled me out of the pack and said, this is what we need. We, we need, you know, uh, a better balance of professional backgrounds. So yeah, I was not the most popular guy in the bucket uh, <laughs> back in the nineties, but we're much better in what I, what I do like is, you know, at Euroshop, I'm going to call them out. In my mind, compared to NRF, Rela, some of these other guys, I see earlier stage emerging tech at Euroshop that I typically don't see here in the U.S. And I attribute that largely to the VC flows are far more, as you well know, far more restrictive over there than here in the U.S. I mean, here in the U.S., you go have a glass of wine with some trillionaire. He gives you a few billion bucks. You don't have to do anything <laughs> until you have a scalable, ready-to-go model. That doesn't happen in Europe. So yeah, that's how I found Rapid Tech. I mean, they were two kids. They looked like they were about 14 years old, a little round bar table, hardly a sign. And it was an awesome technology, but I never would have seen that at that stage at NRF or Rela. Just wouldn't happen. So yeah. We're level setting better. I'm more encouraged about the technology. AI has virtually unlimited uh, capacity to address entire business problems of which shrink would be part. Um, anyway, so I think, Matt, do you see any other questions? I do not. And I'm assuming I'm clicking on the right stuff. Yeah, I don't, yeah, see. I don't, don't see any others. We've worn them out, Brand. I think we've worn them out. Well, <clears throat> that's good. We I've, I've yet to have a broadcast go over, so this is awesome. This is also recorded, Adrian, as you know, and it'll be posted on LinkedIn with a few days, so we'll probably have a ton more listeners. Yeah. Um, for the listeners that are out there and on the recording, everybody I think knows Dr. Adrian Beck. He is really the renowned expert on uh, objective research around the globe and helping us understand and getting our arms around risk. Um, with data, which has always plagued the industry, is having data that we can go to battle with. So I greatly appreciated Adrian, appreciate you. giving us a few extra minutes. And uh, people know that Adrian's on LinkedIn. So if you have specific questions for him, he would be the man that I would go to. Otherwise, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Beck. And we will see you next month with a different topic. Thanks, Brian. Take care. Cheerio. Take care, see you. Thank you.